Welcome back to another Space News video with me. As we still reel from the mighty success of Starship's fourth flight, further confirmation of even more guaranteed excitement for Flight 5 emerges, with continued assurance of a super heavy tower catch and Ship 30 having its entire heat shield replaced. What's really weird though is that there were no orbital launches last week, at all, not even a Falcon 9. We did at least see one sub-orbital launch though, a Terrier improved Malamute hypersonic testbed launch from the Wallops flight facility, and aboard the ISS we got a tour of Boeing Starliner capsule which is currently docked to the station from astronauts Suni Williams and Butch Wilmore, and the station itself saw some groundbreaking developments in 3D printing. All of this and so much more, including the first tests of a new super heavy launch vehicle engine, so sit back and enjoy. So, as we all know, Starship's fourth integrated flight test on the 6th of June was an astonishing success. We of course saw the Super Heavy booster perform a soft landing in the Gulf of Mexico at a virtual tower location with no faults, aside from one engine shutdown that didn't affect the flight thanks to Starship's engine redundancies, and Starship Ship 29 not only survived peak heating during atmospheric re-entry, but made it all the way through, and despite some damage to the flight control flaps, the engines managed to reignite and perform a flip and landing burn, soft landing in the Indian Ocean. This happened at night and there was only one very damaged onboard camera filming thing so we couldn't really see very much, but in optimal conditions it would have looked like this, which is incredible considering what the spacecraft had to endure prior to this. But things weren't perfect, the ship splashed down 6 kilometers off target and there's no denying that the flap did sustain some damage through melting of its stainless steel structure and apparent at least partial failure of the vehicle's heat shield. So what's going to be done about this? for Flight 5? Well, the answer is a drastic refit of Ship 30's heat shield. Despite its heat shield being complete, it was moved into the high bay and surrounded with scaffolding as workers began ripping off all of the tiles, to replace them with ones described by Elon as being twice as strong as the old ones. So the new uh, heat shield tile is about twice as strong as the ones that were on the last flight. It's not going to be a small job, each starship has over 18,000 tiles in total. Hopefully the new heat shield will enable Ship 30 to hold up better to re-entry than Ship 29 for Flight 5. However, for me personally, when it comes to Flight 5, it's not the starship that I'm most excited about, it's super heavy. Given that Booster 11 successfully landed at its virtual tower site, the next flight will see the booster attempt landing at the real tower site. It'll come in aiming for the water, but will course correct at the last moment if it detects no anomalies, and then, well, what you see in this render should hopefully play out for real. Work on the chopsticks in anticipation for this historic moment is already underway, with the entirety of Stage 0 undergoing post-launch checkouts, with so far no obvious major damage, and we also saw the testing of the booster landing rail, which as you can see can rise up and down to help dampen the force of impact when the booster lands. Despite the lot of work required for Ship 30, Elon is still optimistic for Flight 5 to take place in late July, so about 6 weeks, meaning that it won't be long before we get to see SpaceX put this insane plan to the test. If, worst case scenario, the tower is significantly damaged during the catch attempt, then at least we'll soon have a backup. Work continues on the creation of Orbital Pad 2, with overnight concrete pouring captured by NASA spaceflight following the delivery of 4 tower feet. These were unloaded from the truck and moved to the construction site, and then it wasn't long before we saw the delivery of some massive tower base parts, which will, as the name implies, form the base on which the tower sits. These were later lifted into position, meaning that Tower 2 is officially going vertical. The base portion of the tower differs from the upper portions in that it's a solid structure rather than a hollow metal frame, and the wall segments that seal the gaps between the vertical base beams have begun being lowered into place. Now, in the intro of this video, I mentioned that we didn't see any orbital rocket launches last week, not even Falcon 9, which is most unusual. But this wasn't exactly due to lack of trying. SpaceX did plan on launching another Starlink mission on the 14th of June from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, which would have carried 22 Starlink satellites to Shell 10. We actually got all the way to engine ignition, but then an anomaly was detected and the launch was aborted. Launch abort following engine startup is quite rare for SpaceX these days, so I'm curious about what happened here. No concrete launch re-attempt date has been set yet, but we're probably looking at later this month for this. 
We didn't see zero rocket launches at all though, we did see the launch of what we assumed to be a Terrier improved Malamute sounding rocket launch from NASA's Wallops flight facility on the 12th of June, which was the first hypersonic flight for the US Missile Defense Agency's new hypersonic testbed that's designed to provide a common platform for hypersonic experiments. Unfortunately, due to the military and therefore classified nature of the launch, it's not even been confirmed what the rocket was, and there was no launch live stream of the event. So I'll just assume, like most news sources, that it was a Terrier improved Malamute and use some other launch of that rocket as B-roll for this bit. According to the Missile Defense Agency's director, General Heath Collins, the launch was a huge success for them, marking the beginning of an affordable testbed to conduct hypersonic experiments and represents a significant step forward in hypersonic testing capability. Starliner is still docked to the International Space Station's Harmony module, and astronauts Suni Williams and Butch Wilmot gave us a tour of the capsule's interior. It looks probably a little cramped, and uh, it's actually fairly roomy for just Sonny and myself with just the two of us. Uh, obviously, you don't need a large cockpit, so it's actually sized perfectly for us as far as for controlling the spacecraft. Now, crewed space capsules aren't the only thing the International Space Station hosts. Obviously, its primary function is an orbital laboratory. And NASA has shared some interesting milestones in 3D printing that have recently been achieved on the station. This is the Redwire Cardiac Bioprinting Project, which has successfully created the first 3D printed cardiac tissue on the space station. This tissue was successfully sent down to Earth back in April. The findings from this research could lead to breakthroughs in manufacturing organs and tissues, providing an alternative to donated organs, which are in short supply. The benefits of conducting this 3D printing in the space station's microgravity environment include enhancement of the printing by the increased physical stability made possible by the reduced gravitational force. We're a long way off human trials of 3D printed organs, but I'm confident the technology will get there thanks to innovative bioprinting experiments such as this one, and once we eventually do get there, it'll transform medical treatments and biological research. It's not just cardiac tissue being 3D printed on the station though. Recently, we also saw success stories about the station's Columbus Laboratory module, something I actually had the privilege of walking around a replica of back at the KSP2 ESA event in February 2023. Oh, those blissful pre-KSP2 days. <laughs> in recent developments, the Columbus Laboratory hosted a successful metal 3D printing experiment. ESA's metal 3D printer created a small S-curve of liquefied stainless steel in an initial phase of testing, which will hopefully eventually lead to a fully operational version of this metal 3D printer, which could enable future astronauts to produce essential parts while in space. If you're sad that Delta IV Heavy has retired and thus rid the world of a triple core rocket, which is obviously three times cooler than a single core rocket, then worry not, as China made big steps last week in the development of its crewed triple core Long March 10, a super heavy carrier rocket designed for crewed lunar missions, capable of lifting 70 tons into low Earth orbit and 27 tons into translunar injection trajectories. The program development of the vehicle was reportedly completed in April this year, and last week saw the first test of the propulsion system for the rocket's first stage. The China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation stated that the three YF-100K engines started normally, operated stably, and then shut down on schedule, with ground thrust reaching 382 tonnes. Laon Aerospace was short-staffed last week, because its only employee, me, was mountain biking during the days I normally spend making Kerbal content. So last week's video was somewhat different, but still nonetheless entertaining, I hope. I decided to visit one of KSP's most underutilized features, custom missions, and tried out three community-created challenges to varying levels of success. If that sounds interesting to you, then it should now be one of the cards you can click on on screen, and on the left there are the names of my Patreon supporters and channel members whose support enables me to fund the production of this content for you, so do consider signing up if you want to support what I do here. But that's all from me today, I'll see you on Saturday for more Kerbal content, and until then, goodbye!